Let's face it, we have challenges ahead, so we need MPs to listen to experts and collaborate. Australia has what it takes to thrive in the new economy and plan a positive future. My climate change bill is just the first step. With your vote, I'll work for a dynamic, sustainable economy. Stand up for integrity and trust in government. Support modern health care and be a climate leader for our future. Let's catch the wave of opportunity. Spoken and authorised by Zali Segal Wuringa. Hi everyone, it is so exciting to be here. Climate leadership, we so need it. If I could, so thank you everyone for joining in. It's going to be a very interesting evening, I hope. But if I could first pay my respect to Aboriginal elders, past, present and emerging on the land on which I can come from, uh, which is currently under contention in terms of tra traditional owners' names, but to all traditional owners of all the lands on which we, everyone joining, come from. It is so important that we learn from that such a rich cultural history, 65,000 years, um, and to learn to tread lighter on this earth and work together to keep it and preserve it for future generations. And I do acknowledge the sorrow um, and that the land was never ceded. So in 2019, we were joined by four panellists with a deep knowledge about climate change and the impacts and the transition to a net zero economy. And so some of them are back with us today and it really has been such a pivotal three years. We haven't gotten enough movement from the government, but in terms of all of you, the public has changed so much its understanding of how far we need to go in emissions reduction, but also what we can do. Before the last federal election, we were debating coal-fired power stations and whether we would be building new ones. Now, there's no, there's no debate. We know we're heading towards net zero. The question is how fast are we going to go there? And we know that renewables are dominating our power markets. Global investment in the low-carbon energy transition hit $755 billion in 2021 and 2022. And we think 2022 should eclipse that, even with everything that's going on with COVID and the pandemic around the world. So the question is, how fast can we get to 100% renewable in Australia and globally? And we know that we need to do that. There's dire warnings this week from the IPCC reported uh, Australia will be uniquely exposed as a continent to the impacts of global warming and climate change. And as we know this week, the floods that are hitting northern New South Wales and much of the East Coast are such a dire reminder of how exposed our communities are. We know these events are getting supercharged by global warming and we are on track for that to get worse. And unfortunately, the only way we can deal with that is to reduce emissions. And we know that we're just not doing it fast enough to do mean, have a meaningful difference to the trajectory of global warming at the moment. Now, there's a lot of debate in Australia about reducing emissions, and we have a government that keeps the handbrake firmly on. They simply don't want to acknowledge the transition of where we're going. But we actually have the smart people, we have the technology, you know, we have the innovation, and we have the will. So the question is, we need to make the difference. You know, why are we not making that difference? So the smart pup, uh, each sector has an obstacle. There, there are obstacles in each sectors in how we can transition. But with the right support and the right plan, we can do it. We need to make sure public money is going in the right direction. direction. Um, and we need to make sure that government is focused on actually taking Australia forward and making Australia safer rather than holding us back from the opportunities. So that's why tonight I'm releasing the five steps to net zero plan. It's not complicated. It just breaks it down in clear steps that we can take to get us to net zero, but importantly, get us to meaningful emission reductions by 2030. So we'll talk a bit about that policy over the course of tonight. It's about looking at first legislation. We need to pass the climate change bills. It's about looking at our energy transition, getting to at least 80% renewables by 2030. It's looking at industry and transport and then looking at agriculture and how do we actually regenerate Australia. We can talk about policies like tax rebates to make electric vehicles cheaper for families, 
an electrifying industry fund to transition our industry to renewable feedstocks, and of course, the climate change bill. So, and all of these, the big question of always, how can they be funded? We currently fund fossil fuels to a tune of 80 to one compared to the money invested in renewables. So there is more than enough money in the budget that is going to fossil fuels to fund these policies. So tonight, experts in the field from climate science, environment, energy, energy finance, investment and industry, we learn what's happening in those areas and their view on the plan and what we can do. So each expert in our panel will provide insight on how the five steps from legislation to agriculture can help accelerate our journey to net zero. So for tonight, I'll start with Tim Flannery, the 2007 Australian of the Year. In 2013, he founded and is the Chief Counselor of the Australian Climate Council, Australia's largest and most successful crowdfunded organisation. He's currently Distinguished Visiting Fellow in Climate Change at the Australian Museum in Sydney. And Tim Flannery has also taught at Harvard University and has advised governments both in Australia and Canada. My other guest is Tim Buckley, who has founded the Climate Energy Finance Australasia in 2022, having worked with the global think tank IEFA over 2013 and 2020 to 2021. Tim was co-founder of a startup, Global, Global List Clean Energy Equities Fund with Westpac and as a corner store stone investor. And from 1998 to 2007, he was the managing director of Citigroup, head of Australasian equity research and worked at Macquarie Group in Australia and then Deutsche Bank in Singapore as a top rated equity analyst since 1988. And finally, Heidi Lee. Heidi is the chief executor of Executive Officer of Beyond Zero Emissions, a leading Australian think tank demonstrating how the country can prosper in a zero emissions economy. So she has led the organisation's recent Million Jobs Plan and it is a phenomenal piece of work, much referenced in a lot of my policy. It showed how in just five years, renewables and zero emissions projects can deliver 1.8 million new jobs in the regions and communities that where they needed the most. Beyond zero emissions, current work is focused on renewable energy industrial precincts, so very important piece of work. So I've been collecting some questions from many of you and I'll go straight to the questions for the panel. And my first one, I'm going to go to Tim Flannery because one thing we hear a lot of from the government is talk about carbon capture and storage and how do we uh, you know, do some carbon sequestration. A big part of the five steps to net zero calls for the planting. We need to reforest Australia, eight mega hectares of tree planting and soil carbon sequestration by 2030. Now in 2017, Tim, you published Sunlight and Seaweed, an argument for how to feed, power and clean up the world, in which you look at the important question of carbon sequestration. So drawing on that, what are the key actions and technologies that can draw down carbon? Explain it a little bit for everyone and the viability of the plan to reforest Australia. Sure, look, thanks so much, Lali, and thank you for inviting me to be here in front of this great audience. It's wonderful to have so many people uh, listening in. Um, look, the thing about drawdown is we know we need it. We know that in order to reach a stable climate now, we have to draw some CO2 out of the air. We also know that one of the ways that doesn't work is carbon capture and storage. We have wasted billions and billions of dollars trying carbon capture and storage at the end of coal-fired power plants, at the, uh, the, in other circumstances with gas and so forth. And really it just hasn't stacked up economically and the plants that have had a billion or more invested in them uh, in the US and Canada are now closed or closing. So, you know, I wouldn't rule out as a scientist, you can never say never, but, you know, as far as we know, it's not a, a, a great way forward. So what are the great way forwards? Well, let's, let's have a look at them. The best one is the one you identified, Zali, which is taking care of our lands and waters. After all, our lands and waters are what created our climate system. It was the drawdown that they created that was so important. And I just want to give you one example from the oceans about this. You know, the recent recovery of whales after we banned whaling means that whales now draw down about a billion 
tons of carbon more than they did 50 years ago when they were almost extinct. And they do that through defecating, they poo out all their food and those bits sink to the bottom of the ocean and the whales eventually die and sink to the bottom of the ocean carrying huge amount of carbon with them. So no one would have imagined back in the 70s when we were banning whaling that one of the outcomes would be a billion tonnes of carbon less per year, but that's the reality. We know that if we take care of our waters, seaweed can do a great job of drawing down CO2. Um, you know, complete ecosystems that haven't been fished to the limits of sustainability um, are great at drawing down CO2. And, and as you say, um, forests are incredibly important. You know, when you look at the Australian landscape and look at the devastation that we've wreaked on it uh, in terms of destroying forests and devastating soils, you see that you know, we have lost a lot of potential to, to live sustainably and draw down CO2 at the same time. So planting forests, hugely important. We have some of the most carbon dense forests in the world here in Australia, and if we keep growing them, it'll be a great outcome. But I just want to point, Sally, if I've got time, to two or three more potential solutions. One of them involves the use of silicate rocks. Now, over the long term, the earth has balanced its carbon budget really through the decomposition of these rocks called silicate rocks. They're really abundant in Australia. And if you take, say, a kilogram of olivine, which is one of the common silicate rocks here in Australia, and grind it up and let it just decompose, it will turn, it will draw down 1.25 kilograms of CO2 by decomposing into carbonate. And the great thing about this is that, that we know that if you put that silicate rock like olivine on a field where you're growing wheat or, or corn, you'll enhance the uh, amount of uh, crop that you get by 10 to 20%. So there are real win-wins in this. We can have better agriculture, we can draw down CO2, and we can look after our ecosystem. So silicate rocks are important. The problem for Australia is, of course, to quarry all of the rocks we want to quarry and grind them up and transport them. Using current technologies, we burn, burn a lot of fossil fuels, which is why it's so important to clean up the energy sector first and then the transport sector, as you rightly point out, in your five-step plan. So that's, that's one real big thing we can do once we clean up the energy and transport sectors. Growing seaweed's another one. And we know that we, the world is gonna need more food in 2050 than it uses today, and particularly high quality protein. Um, uh, seaweed farms can not only um, be used as nurseries for fish and so forth, which can be harvested in shellfish, but they also result in the deposition of CO2 through seaweed fragments and so forth off into the deep ocean where it's sequestered. So that's another important opportunity for the country. Thirdly, people are now talking about direct air capture. Um, it, it's hard to say how this is gonna work out, but people have invented machines that can capture CO2 and turn that CO2 into useful products. Some people put it into greenhouses to feed plants. Other people make jet fuel with it. There's a lot of opportunities there, but that's just a kind of a almost over the horizon technology, but, but it is coming up. But we can see overall, I just wanna make the point that we can see how overall we can be living in a far better world with all the amenity that we want, an enhanced food supply, a much more beautiful environment, a much more stable climate, if we take the right pathway in terms of weaning ourselves off fossil fuels and getting onto a sustainable footing in terms of, um, in terms of the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. So I'll leave it there, so there may be more questions, but I'll, there's a lot to say, but I think I've said enough. There's always lots of questions, Tim, um, but that's it's fascinating. Yes, there's no doubt that we are unfortunately already, lot, there's a lot of warming baked in because the amount of carbon we've already emitted. And so that piece of sequestration is going to be so important. But Tim Buckley, so one of the key ways that we will finance the Five Steps to Net Zero plan is through phasing out fossil fuels. Now, there's been a lot of discussion of late around that transition. We know we are installing record amounts of solar PV in Australia. Communities are doing the heavy lifting. I would say state governments are also doing the heavy lifting. Federal government, not so much. Um, but we know that we're still spending a huge amount on fossil fuels. Um, at the moment, we I think that ensuring a reasonable rate of royalty for fossil fuels is so important. We currently spend over $10 billion a year and on subsidies for fossil fuels. So 
Could you explain a little bit Australia's current approach to fossil fuel subsidies and why it is that we can get back on track? We can change that and actually reinvest that where Australians will get such a better return for it. Thanks, Sally, and uh, good evening to everyone. And could I also acknowledge the traditional owners? I'm coming to you from the Gadigal lands of the Eora Nation. Um, all of our states and territories uh, in Australia have committed to aggressive action on climate change. And so the states are leading without doubt. But against that, as you mentioned, Zali, the federal government is caught in an absolute time warp. They're pulling in exactly the opposite direction. And the obvious first starting point when you need to change direction is to stop adding fuel to the fire. And by that, as you said, removing the $10 billion a year of subsidies to fossil fuel companies is an obvious starting point. So obvious, yet the federal government hasn't done it. Now, if we just pick one of them, the, the largest subsidy is the direct fossil fuel, diesel fuel rebate that has been around now for 60 years. So I would have thought the fossil fuel industry, the mining industry of Australia has had 60 years to actually get established. They don't need subsidies anymore. Yet at the end of the day, they still get $8 billion a year of diesel fuel rebates. And that would be a logical starting point. Now, Angus Taylor talks about being technology agnostic, but I would argue he's anything but. When you've got a massive $8 billion a year subsidy for expensive imported diesel coming into Australia, it's really hard for electric vehicle technologies to compete against an $8 billion a year subsidy. Now, again, when we think about it in the perspective, Australia is one of the largest bulk commodity mining countries in the world. We're in the top one, two or three in bulk commodity mining. And yet Rio Tinto, BHP, Glencore, Peabody are all sitting there waiting. Twiggy Forest acknowledges this issue belatedly. He's accepted that we need to phase out the diesel fuel rebate. He is leading the charge. But the other big miners are sitting there saying, let Twiggy lost lead, let him explore what is required. And then once he's proven it up, they'll adopt it without doubt. I mean, they've made commitments to net zero emissions, but they're taking the laggards way out. They're leaving other players to lead the charge. Now, if you think about Australia's four or five biggest commodity, bulk mining commodity companies, they are five of the biggest commodity companies in the world. Their collective buying power to the original equipment manufacturers globally in rail haulage, in um, freight haulage and in heavy duty equipment, they are the five biggest buyers of heavy duty equipment. If all five of them decided that they would actually move to electric vehicles over the next five years, as Twiggy Forest is committed to doing, as he is now doing, then the combined power of those five companies could transform the world in the space of five years. Because if BHP, Rio, uh, Glencore, even Hancock Prospecting and Fortescue all actually did it together. Yeah, okay, we can leave Hancock prospecting out. We know her view on climate science, but anyway, let's not go there. I don't want to be sued. Um, so at the end of the day, the idea of actually phasing out the diesel fuel rebate could save the federal government $8 billion a year. It would remove and level the playing field and then allow low cost domestic zero emissions solutions to compete. And by that, I'm talking about the electrification of the Australian mining fleet. And it is literally one of the biggest fleets in the world. So that is a huge impediment to a technology neutral outcome. And, and so that would be the first point. We don't need to necessarily even subsidize the electric vehicles in heavy haulage. We just need to remove the subsidies to stop them doing it. And while I'm on subsidies, to me, the other big one, you mentioned $10 billion of direct subsidies. The other one is that we actually have a really unlevel playing field when it comes to corporate tax. The average Australian corporate, corporate in Australia pays almost a full 30 cents in the dollar corporate tax cash every year almost uh, predictably 100% reliable. And yet we don't apply the same corporate tax rules to these foreign tax haven based multinational companies, mining companies, 
fossil fuel companies who are using Australia's public resources for their own private tax-free gain. So that's another massive subsidy. I don't understand why any Australian government would be refusing to level the playing field. They're in fact holding back Australian domestic corporates doing the right thing, paying 30 cents in the dollar corporate tax, and yet letting the Chevrons, the Shells, the BPs, the, um, in fact, all of these global giants literally pay no corporate tax in Australia. And so again, Angus Taylor's let's let the best technology win. No, he's absolutely handicapping Australian corporates and then he's handicapping the electrification and the use of uh, electric vehicles to replace really expensive, high emissions, imported diesel. It's an obvious starting point if we wanted to actually accelerate the decarbonisation. Yeah, well, look, I think it's important that we start here because everyone always, you know, the sceptics always come up with the cost question. And of course, it's never a zero sum game. And we know that the cost of acting now is so much more fiscally responsible than leaving it later, um, that those costs will compound and increase. Um, and the cost of not acting is far, far greater than the cost of acting. Um, but it's clear, you know, when the government gives us that rhetoric of technology, not taxes, is actually really a load of rubbish. Because what it is, is uh, it's actually the true slogan they should use would be technology and subsidies to fossil fuels. Um, so there we are. But Heidi, let's get on to electrifying everything, in particular industry. So the sceptics will often bring up that heavy industry, how are we going to do it? We've gotten so far on fossil fuel, on thermal power. How are we going to do the transition? Now, Beyond Zero Emissions has done some fantastic work mapping out what will be a complex transition. No one is denying that. But unless we address that transition, we will miss out. There's no doubt about it. And there are so many possible um, gains for us where we could have renewable energy industrial precincts, uh, like the one proposed that you've worked on in the Hunter. So how do you envisage these precincts will help Australia get to net zero? Um, how can they be at the centre of our new export markets? Thanks, Sally, and uh, thanks everyone for joining us tonight. I'm dialing in from the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to those elders and also to those on country all around Australia where we are seeking nationwide to be able to decarbonise rapidly and this will impact all communities. The work that we are doing in industry has built off um, an, a publication that I think first came out in 2017 called Electrifying Industry. And it was all about electrifying industry. So there were solutions in there for electrifying and decarbonising everything from hydrogen, steel, aluminium to beer. And Australians love being able to get all the good things, the same good things that we've got today in a zero emissions future. And that opportunity, that report laid out a plan that, that established that there was technical viability for all of the major industrial activities that we currently take on in this country. Our million jobs plan was that that opportunity to reset our idea about just how quickly we could go and, and really seize the opportunity of that that big upheaval that we were in, where we have already taken stock of so many things that are happening in the country all at once. What could we do if we took the next five years and instead of going slowly and going piecemeal towards this decarbonisation journey, we took this opportunity to turn decarbonisation into a five-year action plan for and rapidly reduce emissions? Because like the, the opportunity cost and the, the, the financial cost, there's an intensively um, worse cost of acting later to the environment as well. So we wanna be able to decarbonize quickly and doing it quickly means taking advantage of opportunities of a global transition. So for Australia, when we looked at our million jobs plan at the manufacturing sector, we took all those solutions out of electrifying industries. Well, all the solutions are there. How could we deploy them at scale? 
And the opportunity for this is around coordination and planning that enables precincts, enables a place-based approach to decarbonising manufacturing. The same way that we think about designing cities and, and making urban infrastructure um, and making sure that we've got all the right amount of water, the right amount of energy, the right amount of waste services and all that stuff that we need for a city, taking that same approach and planning and uh, a future where our current industrial areas around Australia retain their industrial heritage and actually decarbonise and grow to meet global markets for zero emissions products and services. So a couple of reports that we did last year that I think really emphasised the upside of this. One was a review of the potential for a renewable energy industrial precinct, one in the Hunter and also another one in central Queensland. They could grow regional economies by 45,000 ongoing jobs in those two locations alone by 2032. They would expand those regional economies by 13 billion. Now that, that's a huge opportunity for these just two regions to be able to capitalise on, on taking the, the transition and taking a really planned approach towards a zero emissions future for industry in those places. The second piece of work we did looked at the export opportunity of doing this. And if Australia took another view of our, our export potential and said, instead of exporting fossil fuels, what if we doubled down on the, our potential to generate massive amounts of renewable energy and use that energy here onshore to power factories to process these minerals and these, these things that we currently export to turn them into products that the world needs, zero emissions products made with renewable energy. Over, by 2050, our study showed that we could get to $333 billion per year in revenue from renewable exports. That is three times more out than our current fossil fuel exports generate for us. So that's the upside of taking a really coordinated planned approach to rapidly decarbonising our manufacturing sector here in Australia. Yes, well, well, so there we are. The opportunity is there. The question is going to be, um, grabbing it um, and, and that's where the frustration is for so many is that our transition is so piecemeal at the moment there just isn't a coordinated approach um, and it's still a uh, an approach from the government that relies on supporting fossil fuels it's not a true commitment to transition uh, one of the areas we can see that so clearly is in transport uh, Tim Buckley, um, cleaning up transport, it's a key component of the plan, the five step to net zero. We know transport is rapidly electrifying overseas in the markets, particularly ironically China, Norway. You've written about Norway. I've met with the Norwegian ambassador. But in Australia, transport is lagging. It is still such a minute proportion of new car sales being electric. And yet we see with the current world events, the price of fuel, there is a lot of instability. And so there is so much to be gained in having that national sovereignty in terms of our power supply and, and fuel. So the growth of electric vehicles, especially in China, means what does that mean for Australia and how do we capitalise on that transition? I mean, we've heard of so many car manufacturers that are making commitments now of all new models will be EV by 2030, 2035, depending on the car manufacturers. We have no car manufacturing industry in Australia. We could have something around electric vehicles, but we don't. We've had great technology around car chargers, uh, but we've, again, fast chargers. We've lost them to overseas because we are just not a very good market ourselves. Um, where do you see our opportunities to capitalise on that transition to clean transport? Thanks, Sally. I, I think the transport sector is a huge opportunity. It's inevitable. It's also illustrative of why I am so bullish about finance policy and technology and economics combined will solve the global climate crisis. The question is, can we do it fast enough to avoid even more calamities in the meantime? But transport, electric vehicles, I think electric vehicles in the last 12 months have already won the race globally. A very aggressive comment, but the death of the internal combustion engine is almost now 100% assured. And even the idea that hydrogen fuel cells are uh, going to play a relevant role in passenger vehicles, I think is now um, being proven it won't happen. 
electric vehicles are winning the race without doubt. Now we all hear about Tesla, but it's actually the Chinese, as you alluded to, uh, who are the world leaders in this space. And uh, we saw in 2021, China's electric vehicle sales grew by 154% year on year. They are half the world's electric vehicle sales in 2021. They dominate the global industry. And like a lot of technology industries of the future, zero emissions industries of the future, China is absolutely winning this global race. They see it as a technology race, an industry race, and they will dominate this race. Now, as I have absolutely no doubt on that. It's absolutely relevant for us to get involved. They're our biggest trade partner. We could be an absolutely key supplier to them. We will be a key supplier in all of the commodities that they need to build the electric vehicles. But to me, it's, it's now almost inevitable. Um, the invasion of, of Ukraine has also highlighted another key driver of decarbonisation. Russia is the world's second largest exporter of oil. It is their major revenue export debt source for the entire country. And so like 80% of their fossil fuel exports are oil. We hear a lot about the coal and their LNG, but oil is 80% of their exports. So in fact, um, permanently cutting the use of oil and gas imports actually is an effective way of developing energy security. And so we're hearing that as a major topic in Europe right now that we actually need to see uh, the development of zero emissions domestic energy generation for energy security, for national security. And I'd argue the war in Ukraine is very much about that, um, securing the, uh, well, gas pipelines, for example, and exports. So we've actually seen Germany, in fact, last week announced that they're pulling forward 100% decarbonisation of their electricity by 15 years to 2035 as a direct response to getting off the dependence on gas. But that is also a part of getting off the dependence on oil imports because you electrify your transport sector. So uh, passenger vehicle manufacturing globally is going through a massive unstoppable transition right now. Um, I was just reading last night about a company I'd not actually heard of. I'm sure most of us haven't heard of it, but uh, it's called, it's just changed its name. It's called, I'll have to read it, uh, Stellantis of Europe. It owns 14 of the world's largest car brands, Maserati, Audi, Jeep, Chrysler, Peugeot, Feet, uh, Citron, Citron, etc. So they own 14 of the biggest brands in the world. They just put out their 2030 strategy and their strategy involves spending 30 billion euros on capital investment to develop electric vehicles by 2025, 30 billion euros. It's a survival tactic for this company. They spent the entire day in explaining to all of their global investors how they are going to drive decarbonisation, how they're going to drive 40, 50% reduction in emissions by 2030, how they're going to drive 100% emissions reduction by 2038, and how electric vehicles will represent 75% of their global sales by 2030. The only reason it won't be 100%, they're targeting 100% by 2030 in Europe, but America is a bit like Australia, a global laggard in this area. And so they're saying 50% EV penetration by 2030 in America, 100% penetration across the whole of Europe for Maserati all the way down, 100% in Europe by 2030. You will not be able to buy an internal combustion engine passenger vehicle within 10 years would be my guess. A new one, you'll be able to buy plenty of um, secondhand clunkers and Australia will be a dumping ground for the res residual manufacturers of those clunkers, but they will be museum relics. Um, so I think your stage three, sorry, step three articulates, it's really important for Australia to have an emission standard. It's really important that we change the perverse incentives in our tax system when it comes to car imports. As you said, we import all of our cars. We need to actually look forward, embrace the opportunity, change the tax structure. We need to get the federal government fleet buying electric vehicles so that they can lead the way they can learn by doing and the federal government can actually be a leader rather than an obstacle. But uh, obviously that's not gonna happen under the current energy minister. 
Yes, no, I agree very much. Um, now, Heidi, part of the plan has to be addressing industry. We've touched on it already a little bit, but um, we can be a clean industrial powerhouse because we are blessed with a huge continent. We have amazing amounts of resources when it comes to solar and wind uh, and hydro. Uh, we see battery technology progressing really, really fast. Um, last month, BMW announced that it would now use 40% low carbon steel in its European Union car manufacturing plant by 2030. So what does that mean? For example, when we flow on from transport to industry and manufacturing, that by 2030, will Australia be in a position to supply companies like BMW that green steel that they are clearly going to be looking for? I, uh, I love looking at the opportunity side of this because Australia's potential to be able to make these products is as big as we want it to be. Because the energy cost is such an important foundation for being able to deliver affordable, com price competitive products into a global market, the fact that we have so much renewable energy and it is so easy to deploy means that we can, if we want to, get on the front foot with this. So we looked at that export potential across categories and green steel being one of them. To get the really big numbers to talk about that 333, we are talking about 2050 for those really big numbers. But remember, this it will be three times the revenue of our current fossil fuel exports. So we're getting three times bigger by 2050, but we have to invest now to hit that trajectory and get going on it. By 2050, we could, if we wanted to, be providing around 10% of a global market for green steel, if we wanted to. We would be building a massive amount of new steel mills. We would be building a massive amount of new renewable energy to power them. But we could also be bringing in around $80 billion a year out of that 333 just for green steel alone. But there are other really big winners as well. And I think we've touched on some of them tonight. And that's looking at our critical minerals. It's looking at things like exporting renewable hydrogen and ammonia. It's looking at aluminium and bauxite and alumina. We need to look at lithium, we need to look at nickel. Like these are all really important foundational things that we have in spades in Australia and exporting them without processing them and getting them to that, that next stage of the value chain means that we are missing out on massive amounts of opportunity, both financially, but also in terms of national security, in terms of actually building our communities and building in regional jobs and expertise in this country about how to add more value to the supply chain and do more onshore. So I think as well as looking at this as, a, as an extractive industry and a value add industry, we also need to think about the manufacturing ecosystem. So talking about building new cars and using green steel to build new cars is part of the solution. But we also have these, these clunkers, these so, this enormous challenge, right, of, of huge amounts of infrastructure that we already have. We have a lot of cars, we have a lot of trucks, we have buses, we have a lot of stuff that's going to be the chassis, the mainframe, the, the, the bulk of this, other than the internal combustion engine, is going to be fine for a long time. What we need to be looking at is building skills around getting value out of what's already here, as well as extracting new potential and new value from what we're currently exporting. So I think we need to look at this from both perspectives there. It's not just about making new stuff, it's also about shoring up and getting value out of what's already here in our supply chains, in our logistics chains, and getting as much as we can out of this as well, because that is how we are going to decarbonize and move really quickly. It's not gonna be replacing every single thing with something new, it's going to be repurposing what we've already got but building our capacity to do that repurposing onshore as well. Yeah, so loud and clear for everyone listening, we've got plenty of opportunity and there is plenty of ways that we can actually build a more prosperous Australia. But obviously one of the things that's, you know, always high um, that's raised with me around climate is that level of anxiety. And just this week, we saw the latest IPCC report come out with a very dire warning that we are on track for fairly catastrophic global warming. And we're seeing just re at the moment the catastrophic floods around New South Wales. We've had two years ago the bushfires. The communities are just not rebuilding. You know, we're getting battered from one disaster to the next. And there is very little proactive planning happening. We know the government has refused to have national risk assessments. And that's why it's so important that we pass the climate change bills because it mandates 
national risk assessments so we can ensure communities that are exposed can be kept safe by having clear adaptation plans to address those risks. But with this IPCC report, Tim Flannery, I mean, it, it's really hard for people. People are really anxious about what it means um, environmentally and the current state of the world. Um, we're seeing announcement after announcements, ambitious clean energy projects around, and it's causing a sense of optimism. But how do we balance that with ultimately the findings in the IPCC? So what's your message to people tonight? Where's our balance between optimism and anxiety? Look, Sally, I think, um, you know, people have every cause to be scared. Um, you know, tonight, as we're speaking, there are thousands of Australians who don't have a home to go back to due to unprecedented floods. And three years ago, when you were elected, just about the time you were elected, there were thousands of Australians who didn't have homes to go back to because of unprecedented bushfires. You know, this is not normal, Sally. We, you know, for Brisbane to have three one in a century floods, as they're called, in the last decade or so, is not normal, yeah? We are moving into a new and, quite frankly, scary climate system. Now, we can limit the damage that can be done um, by moving really, really quickly to clean energy systems. And that is an absolute urgency. The frustration that I've had is I've watched our federal government sleepwalk into this absolute nightmare without planning, without a transition plan, without acknowledgement of what's driving these, these terrible changes that we see around us. And that has to stop, really does. We need, we need very swift action now to cut those emissions as hard and fast as we can. And we need to plan for the future. You know, climate impacts won't go away the day we cut our emissions. We, we are going to have a residual, a, a tail of, 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 of severe weather events, which will go on for some time after we make that transition. So we need to look very carefully about planning around that. Um, if, if I could just say one incredibly important thing is setting a target. I was at the, the climate meeting in Glasgow and I saw nation after nation successfully deal with their emissions problems by setting a target and then empowering people to achieve that target. That's what we have singularly failed to do in Australia, but we really, really need to start doing it now. Um, if you look around the world, I think there is cause for optimism. You see what the Chinese are doing, not just in electric vehicles, but in terms of uh, reducing um, carbon intensity and emissions in their electricity sector. It's enormous. And of course, Europe is, is just doing truly extraordinary things. And as Tim Buckley has said, driven by some other factors like, uh, like global conflict. Um, so we, we know we can do this. We see others around the world doing elements of it, pushing forward elements. We see individual businesses in Australia achieving incredible things. But the thing that's hampering us is that lack of leadership and target setting. If we had that at the federal level, as, as Heidi has said, we could be global champions in this area, more prosperous, more secure, um, and better off in every way than we are today. And yet we're held back by this backwards looking view that somehow fossil fuels are the future, that that's, you know, things are gonna be okay. None of that's true. We stand in a moment of peril, Zali, we really do. And these decisions that are made in the Australian parliament over the next four years and beyond will have real consequences in the real world just as the Glasgow Climate Summit meeting did. So this is an urgent matter and we need to get on with it. And I, I don't want to dismiss people's fears, but I want to say if we do the right thing, we can achieve um, the stability that we all so much need. Well, I must say, you know, over the last three years sitting in parliament, I mean, I pledged to be a climate leader to put forward solutions. And I strongly believe one of our solutions is we need to legislate a, a strong target. And that's the climate change bills provides for legislating net zero by 2050 with a mechanism to bring it forward by listening to the science as we have on coronavirus in terms of getting medical experts, we need to get experts around how we can meaningfully transition every sector. But importantly, it's that strong interim target that we need to focus on. Uh, so I've spent the last three years uh, hammering away at Scott Morrison and the government around that next year by 2050. They've come to it kicking and screaming, screaming sort of half, half 
I don't know if I can really call it with intent because their plan really only delivers 85% reduction um, and there's really still no transition away from fossil fuels. But what we really need is at least is to be aiming for 60% emissions reduction by 2030 and I know we can do it with all the things we've discussed tonight. We can deliver that. Um, it's so important that we really focus on that and everyone has an opportunity to do that very shortly with the election coming up. Now, one of the areas that I've seen hold us back time and time again has, in Parliament in particular has been through the National Party and around agriculture. And whereas we see the National Farmers Association commit to net zero, we see Farmers for Climate Change committed to transitioning to having more sustainable farming practices and that focus on reforestation, which we need to talk about that piece. Um, it's clear politically, the nationals are absolutely holding anything, Australia's climate policy to ransom. I've seen it time and time again in votes in the chamber. But for any of you who ever wants to go, agriculture, right? We know there's great opportunities. We know our agricultural exports face uh, carbon border tariff adjustments if we don't get to a more sustainable and, uh, and lower emission uh, base. We know it is a sector that will be most impacted by global warming impacts. The loss to the sector will be huge. Um, it is an area where they are battered by droughts and floods and bushfires. They are on the front line of those environmental impacts. So what are some of the sensible things that we can do to help agriculture get to net zero as quickly as possible? Who wants to go? Tim, do you want to go for that? Sure, I'll have a bit of a go. Look, look, Zali, most of our agricultural production is in the Murray-Darling Basin. And um, you look at water policy in Australia and it is just a disaster. Again, we're, we're sleepwalking towards catastrophe. We need real reform in terms of water use uh, that makes sure that environmental sustainability is front and centre and which ensures that farmers can get on with some degree of certainty uh, with their business to know they will get water and also the Indigenous communities along the river. I mean, I was shocked to discover that our Indigenous communities don't have water rights in the Murray-Darling Basin, something that really needs to be taken care of. So. Um, I, I, that's what I say, water is an incredibly important thing. Um, government initiatives that's, that prevent illegal land clearing, you know, really, really important. Just enforcing the law as it is almost would be, you know, be great. Um, some incentive, incentives to, to move to more sustainable practice like tree planting on a certain part of your acreage. Again, it's a win-win. You, you get less uh, evaporation um, from, from wind because you're breaking up the wind patterns, therefore greater soil moisture and greater growth. There's a lot of stuff that can happen in those areas. Seaweed can be important too. There's, there's some work going on right now in Tasmania uh, with Fonterra uh, to, to really chart out what a seaweed called asparagopsis can do to reduce methane emissions. And the early results are really promising. You know, the lab results show that just 25 grams of that seaweed per day reduces emissions by 98% in cattle and increases growth rates of the cattle by 20% because all of that energy that was going up in methane is instead going to the cow to allow it to grow and stay healthier. So you know, there's a lot of things it can do, but again, it's an area we really need focus and the focus is gonna be carbon and sustainability. If we had that as a kind of center point for our water policy and our agricultural policy, I'm sure we could continue uh, with a great agricultural sector. Yeah, uh, Heidi, you, did you want to add to that? Especially around, I mean, agriculture is that how we value land as well, that we, if a proportion of all properties was made, was prioritised for carbon sequestration, so reforest, reforesting, replanting with uh, native um, plants and trees, um, that is an additional source of income for uh, for farmers, for, for regional communities. Um, where do you see the obstacles for agriculture and the and the opportunities? I think I think this is one of these sectors where the uh, the key stakeholders are not yet seeing themselves as key beneficiaries in the transition. And so being able to do both and like taking on board that there are really important um, soil management and water management and the whole suite of policy that needs to sit behind effective management of our natural resources. But also in the meantime, looking for these 
also and winds around we can use parts of our our agricultural land to have parts of our energy system coexist with these uh, uh, other purposes so where we can co-locate and get better value out of what we're already doing in a way that respects a whole lot this is a very complex area but in a way that respects all of the stakeholders involved and actually delivers an upside and takes some of the financial pressure off our farmers um, and off these communities who are currently really getting ground down by natural you know weather events and, and things like this that are really making it extremely difficult for them to plan ahead for them to have the confidence in in taking next year's crops to market this is a really important sector that we need a multi-pronged approach to and over the next few months one of the um, ongoing research pieces we'll, that we're doing here at Beyond Zero Emissions will look at those top five um, solutions to the key challenges in every sector, including agriculture. So it'd be great to continue the conversation when we're bringing that out. Oh, well, I look forward to getting more of that information because it is so important. It is that secondary income source for landowners if they are able to have renewable um, energy sources on their land in along with livestock if that's the kind of farming we're talking about um, it makes such a difference because my next question to Tim Buckley so part of the five steps to net zero of course is decarbonizing energy it is the, uh, it is the key area of how we can make the quickest gain in lowering our emissions I we have the technology we have the space, the resources, and the abundant supply of sun and wind. It is absolutely within our means to hit 80% penetration of renewables in the grid by 2030. Mike Cannon-Brooks last week proposed an ambitious takeover of AGL to accelerate coal closures and put us on a trajectory there. We're seeing announcements of early retirement of thermal coal generators, um, power generators. So we know that's there, but is this, so, is this an example of the market working? Yes, this took the government by surprise. Federal government was absolutely surprised by those announcements. Um, we could see them scrambling to see how they could stop it and slow it down because this did not fit their political narrative. So is that an example of the private market working, getting on with the job where the federal government is keeping the handbrake on? And we need to get the government out of the way, don't you think? Well, in one respect, yes, it is an example of that. It's an example of finance coming together with corporations, or in this case, billionaires, to actually solve the problem and provide the leadership that the federal policy vacuum has left. Uh, Mike Cannonbrook is definitely putting his wealth on the table in order to help drive, as he's defined it, the single biggest decarbonisation opportunity in the world. And I don't think that's actually, that, those are his words when he explained why he was doing this. I actually have done the numbers and he's dead right. The carbon, avoided carbon emissions are 289 million tonnes from retiring two of the world's biggest coal-fired power plants early, one by three years, one by 15 years. And so AGL, as we all know, biggest carbon emitter in Australia, one of the biggest in the world. And Mike Cannon-Brooks is talking about showing global leadership, illustrating how we can do it, but at a world scale and putting his own capital on the line and that of Brookfield. So it shows the role global finance can play. Brookfield is one of the most successful infrastructure, renewable energy infrastructure players in the world. And so it's a beautiful alignment of corporate and uh, finance, and it's demonstrating leadership. In contrast, though, and I, I mentioned it at the start, I'll do it again. I'll give Matt Keane a shout out. At the end of the day, our state ministers are show, state energy ministers are showing leadership. And uh, Matt Keane obviously shows the contrast of uh, the state versus federal system because he's a Liberal Party member. And yet he absolutely embraces the opportunity. And it's, I just find, I'm still staggered by the announcement he made just before Araring was announced. Origin Energy announced they were closing the biggest coal fired power plant in Australia seven years early. And Matt Keane had just announced a week before that he had a hundred billion dollars of global investor expressions of interest in the Hunter Valley Renewable Energy Zone alone. So Matt Keane has 
understood the power of finance and the power of corporate, le oh, sorry, of political leadership, what just staggers me is how the feds can't understand it. I mean, it's working for Matt Keen, it's working for Lillian D'Ambrosi, it's working for the Palaszczuk government in Queensland. They're unlocking hundreds of billions of dollars of new investment. And uh, yet at the end of the day, we do have a federation system. COAG is meant to be the meeting of the governments of Australia on energy policy to work together at the national level, working with the states. And yet, uh, unfortunately, the breakdown, the total breakdown of COAG means that the states are having to go it alone. And we're now reliant on corporations, billionaires and global finance to do the heavy lifting. I think it's time the Australian federal government take back the policy framework, take back the leadership and actually set the framework for all Australians. I'm 100% behind Mike Cannon-Brooks. He is a leader for Australia and he's doing what Angus Taylor's too afraid to do. Uh, but Matt Keane, fortunately, is standing right beside him, creating the ecosystem that can ensure 100% grid reliability, even as we accelerate the decarbonisation of the electricity grid in Australia. And that's world leadership. It's uh, ours for the taking. Yeah, absolutely. I look, I agree very much with, with all that. Uh, in particular, though, the role from the federal government is around the transmission. So what the difficulty is, for example, New South Wales government has, I think, mod modified by about four the opportunity around the renewable energy zone in the Hunter as a result of that early closure announcement for Araring. Um, but the problem is we still have that need for the interconnectors, the transmission, and that we need a federal fund to ensure that work gets done. Uh, for example, an east-west transmission interconnector. Um, and that is where the federal government can play a role. And maybe you can uh, give a bit more detail about that because it, it's clear that there is a role to play for the federal government. Um, and we can either, the federal government can either really prevent the progression and slow things down or facilitate that rapid transition with the right investment. Okay, so in terms of finally, we where are we at with, um, so clearly with all this transition to renewables, what we need is a no new oil and gas. So here locally on the beaches, the community was incredibly successful at uh, opposing uh, that there be any uh, oil and gas uh, extraction, so uh, drilling and extraction off the coast from Newcastle to Manly, huge community mobilisation. And let's be really clear, it was, it was ultimately uh, denied by the government because of that community pressure. Um, we saw the state government acknowledge it much sooner, over a year ago, and it has taken the federal government to come at it kicking and screaming again. And I would say it's the fear of the upcoming election um, and the fact that this was so unpopular with our local communities. But we need to do that in more communities. Well, I was very frustrated in Parliament when I saw both the opposition, so both Labor and the coalition all vote for opening up the Beagaloo Basin for fracking uh, for gas. Um, that's a, like a methane bomb waiting to happen. The International Energy Agency has said no new fossil fuel projects to really halt global warming. Um, yet the government is just not going down that road. And, and yet we, we can see that it's absolutely important that there be no new oil, coal or gas developments. Um, what does... And obviously with Russia, we're now seeing that supply crisis around that as well. So what are your thoughts on uh, that need for there to be no new oil and gas, as was made clear by the International Energy Agency, but very much ignored by the Australian government? Tim Buckley, anyone who wants to take it? Oh, I've already probably said too much, but I think it's absolutely, um, dead right, we have to stop the development of new carbon bombs. The IEA has made it absolutely clear, the science is absolutely clear, uh, the path to 1.5 degrees limiting climate action to 1.5 degrees means no new oil and gas or coal development anywhere in the world, yet the Australian federal government is busy approving over 100 new fossil fuel projects as we speak. It's just criminal, um, and yet 
maybe I'll finish on a very positive note because I am actually very positive. It's interesting, the AFR today, so the Australian Financial Review has an interview with the Asian strategist for BlackRock. Now, let's face it, global finance will rule here. Global finance, BlackRock has a 10 trillion US dollars of capital and the strategist at BlackRock has just come out today and said, look, the Russian invasion of the Ukraine will accelerate the decarbonisation trends. Why? Because energy security is absolutely key. So I'll just quote BlackRock here. It's not only a green issue, it's a broader supply issue now. We see this as an accelerant to the transition towards energy sources of the future because the energy sources of the past have been shown to be fraught with challenges just in the last couple of weeks. Now, at the end of the day, global finance is moving, our billionaires are moving, corporates are moving, our state governments are moving, and the opportunities, as Heidi has illustrated uh, with a new number of examples, they are real, they are huge. Australia will be a renewable energy superpower. We should grab this opportunity with both hands. It is real, it is present, and it's Australia's for the taking, and it's only the fossil fuel Luddites who control our federal government who are standing in the way. Thanks, Tim. Well, I'll take that as your final word. Tim Flannery, what's your final word to viewers on climate uh, and on our transition? Look, I just say, you know, we're in a crisis. Um, we need to act right now, but to act right now will bring enormous opportunity to us. Don't leave the transition for another five years, another 10 years. It will well be too late in a decade's time. So the time for action is now. Thank you. And Heidi, so we know we've got opportunity. Uh, we know we have to do it, but there's also that opportunity. So what would be your final words of wisdom to the participants? Oh, I, I have no wisdom. I, I stand uh, among um, absolute giants. What I'd like to encourage everyone to do, we've talked a lot about global leaders and the top end of town uh, taking initiative and leading the way. What I would like to see is if you are really interested in the transition and you'd like to understand what's going on on the ground in regional communities, buy a subscription to the Newcastle Herald. The Power and the Passion is the name of a series that they've put out this week. It is fantastic reading. It is real. It is on the ground and it is showing us exactly what that conversation is. People in regional communities who are known for their fossil fuel excellence are not blind to what is coming. They are leading the way. There are absolute, the, the future of Australia is in their hands. They have the talent, they have the resources, they have the experience of running world-class like machinery and the largest coal export hub in the world. That skill can come back and be reapplied to Australia's clean manufacturing and a superpower future. This is our opportunity. Subscribe to these regional papers and see uh, like a real dose of optimism happening right there all around Australia. Thank you. Well, that should put everyone at least feeling more optimistic. Um, I would have to add to my, my call that, look, in the next three months we have an election and if there was ever an election where your, not, your vote one climate should be your priority, it is now. We've seen that our communities are not safe. Global impact, Global warming impacts are happening now. Our communities, we had communities evacuated from bushfires, we've got communities evacuated from floods. These things, these events are happening year after year. It, they have compounding effect, not just on our environment and our health, but on our economy. There is no, no scenario within which our economy will just continue as normal as global warming worsens. So we have to act. The big question for everyone, are you gonna act and have an opportunity to be a leader or are you going to pay a much heavier price and leave this huge intergenerational debt for our kids and our grandkids? So that's why it's so important for me, the five step plan to net zero. Number one, we need to pass the climate change bill. It is the one way in which we can ensure that we have mandates on government to have risk assessment, adaptation plans and mitigation policies. We need to do this around so many sectors. Two, we need to transition to renewable energy. We need to decarbonise our energy sector and we can get to 80% decarbonisation of our energy sector by 2030 if we focus on all those phenomenal opportunities we've talked about tonight. 
industry. We need to transition industry away from, to low carbon technologies. And I believe we can get pretty close to 50% emission reductions on industry by 2030 if we apply the right kind of policies, mechanisms like transmission funds, like a transmission agency uh, to ensure we have a plan in place for communities that will be impacted and workforces. Uh, and then we need to talk about our carbon sequestration and agriculture. We need better land management and water management, as Tim Flannery showed uh, and talked about. We need to um, incentivise landowners, farmers, to have that percentage of, of reforesting their land, uh, make sure banks are valuing, valuing land that is sustainable better than land that is just cleared. Uh, there are so many ways in which we can do that and additional sources of income for landowners and farmers. So, so much opportunity for everyone who would like more information. The five steps to net zero are on my website, so zaliestegel.com.au. And in, if you would like more detail about the first step, which is the climate change bill, you can also go to climateactnow.com.au. I really hope if you have questions or comments, please write into my office. We will send out some more information. Uh, it's such a privilege to have the opportunity to talk about this important area with such experts. Tim, Heidi and Tim, thank you so much for all your advice tonight. Thank you everyone for coming on board and I will speak to you all soon.